All right, well, we're going to continue tonight from last week. You're going to have to excuse me. I'm, my throat got incredibly dry this morning when I was preaching. Um, I made it through it, but uh, I've just kind of felt off. I don't know. I'm okay, but I felt off. So, uh, so you're going to have to excuse the water, and uh, I might have some coughs. So let's see. All right, here we go. So last week, if you remember, we began... Um, as we're working through the Baptist faith and message, talking about uh, Article 5, which is uh, God's purpose of grace. And last week, we focused on the first half of the article, which is, uh, it talks about election. Um, And then the second half of the article of God's purpose of grace is what we'll call eternal security. Um, and, And if you remember last week, I spent a little bit of time at the beginning explaining why these two things are bunched together under grace, because they're, they're interdependent. Um, we can only have security if God secures it for us, because uh, if it were up to us, we would lose our salvation the moment we obtained it, um, right? I mean, you know, especially as, as new believers, we, um, you know, here's, here's the thing we've got to remember. New Christians are going to sin, <laughs> New Christians are still going to have struggles. Um, as you mature in faith, you should have less, but we still sin being older in faith, right? More mature in faith. And so uh, we have to remember that sometimes. Sometimes you watch a new believer and, and they struggle and it can become disappointing. But we have to remember that they're like a baby trying to, you know, trying to learn to walk. And we need to be there to help them, encourage them. And, and so long as they continue to confess Christ continue to repent of sin and continue to want to follow Jesus, we need to be their champions in their courts, uh, helping to disciple them, help to love them, help to encourage them. Uh, because if you remember back, some of us needed all that too, right? Um, so anyways, um, we're going to continue to look tonight. We'll, um, well, maybe. It either works or it doesn't work. I don't... <laughs> Okay, you did it for me. I'll try it again here in a minute. So here is the statement from the Baptist Faith and Message that we'll start, again, it's kind of in, it's in two paragraphs. One paragraph is on election. The other paragraph is on eternal security. And so this is what we looked at last week. Election is the gracious purpose of God according to which he regenerates, justifies, sanctifies, and glorifies sinners. We have those four words there that were Uh, broken out under the article of salvation, the the four words that surmise what happens when we're saved. Um, It is consistent with the free agency of man and comprehends all the means in connection with the end. It is the glorious display of God's sovereign goodness, is infinitely wise, holy, and unchangeable. It excludes boasting and promotes humility. And so we won't go uh, too far in, in review tonight so that we can move forward, but um, we are saved by grace. We are saved uh, by what God has done, a- and God has a people whom he is redeeming. A- and if you remember, we, we tried to strike a, a, a very clear balance that, that God is saving, but he is saving as we come to genuine faith. There's no one who's saved that says, "Uh, I didn't want to be, but God made me, right? Uh, God is working through his spirit to bring about regeneration. God is working through his spirit to bring conviction of sin, to bring uh, uh, the teaching of the truth of the gospel and who Jesus is. And, And when that gospel message delivered by man, so, so here's what I mean by that, we're we're given, the, we're given the task to go and make disciples, to go and share the gospel, right? Um, so, so by man, so by our efforts, we go and deliver the gospel to an individual. God is in the background working through the Holy Spirit in that individual. And the individual, it truly, genuinely experiences the truth, the life, the love of Jesus, the work of the Holy Spirit in them, and they embrace the gospel. Um, I'm doing a, I, I'm, I'm teaching my class uh, for Samford right now, and um, week two, we're, we're on election this next week, and 
I gave, the, I gave them a ton of reading. You all get off so much easier than them. Um, I gave them like eight articles to read this week. And, and one of them I, I reread, and I hadn't read it in a long time. And uh, just in teaching here and, and preparing to teach there, it kind of struck me. And, and it, was, it was talking about the, the order of salvation or, or the order salutis, where uh, you, you think about these components and these different things that God is doing in a linear way. And, um, and, and, and this writer said, yes, God does work in enacting these things in those ways, but it's a great error if we spread them out. Because what happens is uh, God works in such a way that when we experience salvation, there is a bunch of things happening simultaneously. Does that make sense? Um, for some of you, it makes sense. For some of you, it doesn't. Um, we're, we're not going to go back and redo next week all over again. So, uh, <laughs> but, but it was helpful to me to think about that and to remember that and to see, um, to see how it was explained that, again, the graces that we experience in salvation, they're not removed from each other. When we're regenerated, we, we come to faith. Like they are, they, they, it's not as though we're regenerated and then five years later we go, oh, yeah, I'm saved, Right? Um, these are graces that we experience that God does um, that, that happen and coincide with, with one another. Um, okay, so this takes us then, this, this is the undergirding, like I said, for, um, for eternal security. If, if grace comes by God's initiative, then he keeps us, right? So if we have um, unconditional, uh, according to us, you know, we, it's, not, it's not because God uh, foresee good in us or foresee what we could bring or, or you know, it's not like, it's not like, uh, <laughs> it, it's not like the draft, right, where, where, you know, the teams are scouting and they're trying to figure out who's going to be, who's going to, who's going to best enhance my team that I need to pick them because what they bring to the table. What we brought to the table was sin, and God had to eradicate our sin through Jesus on the cross, and then the good that we have, the gifts that we have, God instills those in us, and God, uh, God works to sanctify and purify us so that we're useful vessels for him, amen? And so, um, so again, understanding, understanding this creates the undergirding by which we can have a full assurance of our salvation. And so that's why uh, the next article moves on. You're going to have to click it for me. And, it's, and this is what it continues and says. All true believers endure to the end. Those whom God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall persevere to the end. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit, impair the graces and comforts, impair their graces and comforts, and bring reproach upon the cause of Christ and temporal judgments on themselves. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith, Unto salvation. Our statement of faith is very, very clear that all who have, who are genuine believers, all who have received the graces of salvation, uh, you know, regeneration, <clears throat> justification, sanctification, they will reach glorification. Um, and, and so we, we as Southern Baptists are very strong on this point. I, again, I think I told you the other day, um, there are a lot of there. There are a number of things within the Baptist faith and message that you might find quite a few Southern Baptist churches have caveats with, but this, by and large, just isn't. I mean, we just by and large do not find uh, really um, very many Southern Baptist churches. Now, there's forty-eight thousand of us. We're all technically independent, so I'm sure you can find some. But I'm just saying, by and large, this isn't, this isn't something that, that we find uh, controversial or that there's a lot of caveats in amongst 
ourselves. This is, uh, this is pretty standard and, and has been traditionally, right? I mean, those of you who are older, uh, you know, Southern Baptists have always been the once saved, always saved people, right? And uh, so we'll talk a little bit about that as we go on, which, oh, wait, hold on. It's on now. Maybe it'll work. That was my problem. I guess. I thought I turned it on when I got it. <laughs> um, let's look at Romans 8. I, I want to look at, at, at Romans 8. You're going to get your Bibles out for this because it's a, it's a long passage. Uh, I know I usually put all the passages up on the screen, but this is a long one, and I want us to look at it um, because in this we see uh, much of what we've been talking about through, throughout the last few weeks, um, salvation, election, and then the security that follows it. Uh, really, Romans 8 is one of these passages that, that delineates um, this very clearly as Paul writes there. And so we'll begin reading in verse 28 uh, through the end of the chapter. <clears throat> this is what God's word says, beginning in verse 31. Or wait, I, I said 28 will start, right? And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. To, for those who are called according to his purpose. Can I get an amen on that? Right? That's a verse probably most of us have memorized and have had days where we've had to quote it to ourselves and, and remember God. I don't know how, God, but I trust you're working this for your good because I love you and you've called me according to your purposes. For those who he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he called. Those he called, he justified. Those he justified, he glorified. There you begin to see that order of salvation, those different steps that, that you could delineate, um, make up salvation, the experience. Verse 31. Okay, so, so that is the foundation, right? There's the good now we get to see how that relates in, in security, in assurance. Verse 31, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us, how will he also, not, uh, how will he also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, sword... As it is written, for your sake we are be being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, or things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation. What else could you think of? Not even that will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Can I get an amen for that one? The, the word of God is very, very clear. And theologically, when we understand, again, what God is doing in salvation, it becomes logically very clear as well that our salvation is secure. Because it is God. It is God who has called us. It is God who has saved us. It is God who has redeemed us. It is God who has washed us. It is God who has kept us and sealed us. And so again, individuals who have an understanding of, of the doctrine of election that understands that, that it is um, unconditional based on God's call on our life, not conditional based on something that we do, 
it's very logical then and consistent that we understand that we have an assurance of faith, of salvation. That if we experience genuine salvation, we will experience genuine completion of that salvation. Nothing that could ever be imagined could separate us from the love of God. 1 Peter 1.23, since you have been born again. So here we have that here we have that phrase of being born again. That, that refers to Jesus speaking where? Anybody know, have memorized where you find that? John 3, when Jesus speaks to Nicodemus and he says, you must be born again. So here Peter picks up on that same concept. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living an abiding word of God. And so God's word is imperishable. The seed in which we, we have, it, it is an imperishable experience to be born again. Uh, Second Corinthians, and God who establishes us with you in Christ has anointed us and has also put his seal on us and given his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. There's two passages in the New Testament that talk about, uh, we'll, we'll look at both of them. I think I have the, the next one in line here next. If not, it'll come up. There's two passages that we, that we see in uh, the New Testament that, that make this same kind of uh, rationale. One is Ephesians, I believe, 1.4. And here we have 2 Corinthians 1, 21 and 22. And, and it's this, that when we are saved and we receive the Spirit, the Spirit of God is God's seal upon us. Now, you have to go back and you have to think about a time and, and activities and practices and a culture that's different than ours. Because we don't, we don't really uh, use this kind of language and imagery the same that, uh, that they would have back then. Um, if you had an important document in the first century and you were an important person and it was an important document, you would place your seal upon it. So, so like we know the concept, right, from old movies and stuff, uh, a, a wa wax drip seal. And that seal shows ownership, right? That seal uh, proves, uh, it, it is a proof of ownership. And so the New Testament will use this in two places that's very important, where it talks about that the, that, that the Holy Spirit is essentially God's seal on us and our guarantee. It is it, that we have, and, and so when do we receive the Spirit? at the moment of salvation. And so, do you see how the language works? This is, again, this is to provide us with assurance. We are God's. Why? We have God's mark on us. What is that? The Holy Spirit indwells us. The Holy Spirit has come to reside in us. This is part of the, the beauty and the grace of the new covenant that distinguishes itself from the old covenant. In the old covenant, when you became a member of the covenant, you didn't receive the Spirit. In fact, there were a lot of people in the old covenant that show evidence that they didn't know of or have the Spirit of God. But the defining mark of the new covenant is that when you're in it, you receive the Holy Spirit. And since you've received the Holy... I'll, I'll go down a logical train here as we're thinking about this. Since you receive the Holy Spirit, God dwells within you, Christ in you, Colossians will say over and over again. And because God is in you, His Spirit is in you, and part of the role of the Spirit of God is to allow you to abide in Christ, that's why Paul can write in Romans 8 and say, what can separate us from the love of God? What can separate us from God? What can cause us not to be God's? Nothing. Why? His seal is on us. He has marked us as His. And that's what happens in salvation. And so when you begin to understand that, you begin to see uh, the grace and the wonder that we have to have assurance 
that God loves us, that God will save us, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Um, see, it wasn't the next one. John 10, 27, 29. This is Jesus speaking. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. What a beautiful passage, isn't it? When we stop and we look at it and we think about it. First of all this, my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they follow me. Um, this is, the, you know, you can, you can look at this and say, when the gospel is preached, when the voice of Jesus and the proclamation of the good news goes out, his sheep, those who God has given to him, they hear the voice and they go to the master, right? And, and because he's the master, he needs over them, he gives them eternal life. They will never perish. Now, that obviously does not mean physical life right now, does it? Does it? Is, is eternal life physical life? No, lots of Christians die, right? <laughs> the Bible says, you know, we're, we're going to die, but the eternal life is a spiritual life and a resurrected body and a new physical life eventually on a new, on a new heaven, new earth. Uh, where we will eternally not suffer the effects of sin as we do now. And so that's the concept and the idea of the eternal life that Jesus gives. Um, and then again, what is the foundation for assurance? The foundation for assurance is not in your ability to keep your salvation. He doesn't say, and those sheep who keep their act together and continue to follow and listen to me, they'll stay with me. That's not what he says. He says, they hear my voice, they follow me, I'll give them eternal life and my Father. So where is this assurance found in? God himself. And, and what about God? He is greater than all. No one can resist him. No one can thwart his will. No one can cause the sheep to be lost again. Um, I like that one I put in there twice. Okay, Ephesians 1. This is the, uh, this is the other passage that, that um, is another wonderful passage to, to, to memorize, to know, to reference. To if, you, if you don't think it's a sin to write in your Bible, I don't. Uh, <laughs> star this one, highlight this one. This is one often that I go with to, to individuals for, for lots of different concerns. Uh, one of the chief concerns is individuals who struggle with the concept and the uh, idea of having an assurance of salvation. Uh, Ephesians 1, 13 says this, And in him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him. So what just happened to that individual? The gospel came to, him, came to them. They heard it. They received it. And they also, what? Believed in it. How, how is an individual saved? They hear the gospel. They receive the gospel. They believe in the gospel. Right? So he's, he's writing and saying that when you were saved, you, were, you genuinely had this experience. When this happened, at that moment, you were sealed with what? The Holy Spirit. Why, was he called, why is he called the promised Holy Spirit? Who promised that he would come? All right, these are like Sunday school answers for kindergartners, okay? Jesus. Right? We looked at those passages in the upper room. Do you remember when we looked at the upper room discourse? And over and over again, Jesus talked about, um, I'm not going to leave you alone. Right? They're freaked out. You're, he, he says, I'm going. I won't be with you. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We need you. And he says, I'm not going to leave you alone. But 
I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. He says it's for your benefit that I go so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. Um, if you remember, I, I, I preached the sermon, and I, think, I believe the title of it. I know I emphasize this a number of times, but the Holy Spirit is Jesus' presence in us in Jesus' physical absence. So as Jesus cannot be physically with us, he leaves us with the Holy Spirit, which is like Jesus being physically with us. That's the whole point of argumentation there through the upper room discourse that Jesus is giving to the disciples is I'm not leaving you alone. I'm not leaving you without my words. I'm not leaving you without my presence. I'm not leaving you without my guidance. You will receive the Holy Spirit. He's going to come. And then Jesus goes to the cross and he comes back and, and, and before he ascends, remember what he tells him to do? Wait. Don't go out yet. Wait, because when the Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. But you can't do that until you experience and have the presence and the power. And then we read in Acts that that's what they did. They're gathered in the upper room. They're praying. They're waiting. And then on the day of Pentecost, we see God makes a big deal out of the Holy Spirit coming. Why? Because he wanted it to be very, very clear that the promise is fulfilled. And so if you remember that passage in Acts 2, they're praying in the upper room. Suddenly, it sounds the sound of a mighty wind, right? I always think about like a, you know, if you, uh, I, I, I grew up around trains. My grandfather worked for uh, the, 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 the Santa Fe Railroad. And so we were always around trains, like, like his idea for fun was to go and watch a bridge and watch a train go over it. Um, but, uh, but I, you know, you think about a train, you know, and you hear, you know, the, and you hear it as it comes and that, no, you know, you hear the presence of it come to you. And, and I, I, I always think at that experience when the Holy Spirit comes, it, it sounds like a train almost, this, this loud, and you, you hear it come to you. But it sounds like a, it's the sound of a mighty rushing wind but there's no wind. It's just the sound. And then God gives another sign. And so, so that was an audible sign that the Spirit was coming. And then there was a visible sign that the Spirit of coming, right? What was it? Tongues of fire, right? Now, I thought for a long time, because they speak in tongues, that it was like, like it looked like tongues, like fire tongues, and later, I, I like, like much later, like midway in seminary, I read a commentator that said tongues of fire is a way to explain the way that the fire licks. And so it was, it was flickers of flame. And I was like, oh, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> and, uh, and so God gives a visual, a visual, um, he, he gives a visual confirmation that the Spirit has come. And then he gives an experiential uh, uh, com confirmation, right? They begin speaking in languages that they did not know. And they were declaring, they were declaring the goodness of God, and it's confirmed, and we know that it was languages that they spoke. Why? There's people from all kinds of nations gathered around, and they're speaking in the languages that they didn't know. And, and even those from the outside hear them speaking in those languages, and they're like, how do they know that? How can they speak? How can they speak my native tongue? Right? And so they look at them, and they say, they must just be drunk, as though that explains how you can speak in another language. Uh, but, but that's their observation, and they say, no, it's still early. <laughs> and then Peter stands up and begins to preach, and you see, you see the move of the Holy Spirit on Pentecost. As Peter begins to preach, it says that men become, they, 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 they are cut to the heart, God is working in their life. They're cut to the heart and they cry out, what must we do to be saved? And the end result, 
God adds 3,000 individuals to the church that day. What a powerful experience, right? And so that's where it says here that the promised Holy Spirit. You received that same Spirit the same way that they received it. Now, it didn't necessarily come to you with the visible sign that, that God gave to it on that day in that very unique setting. But still, every one of us, when you've heard the word of the gospel and believed in him, you were sealed. Is there anyone who's a Christian who does not have the Holy Spirit? No. Now, some would, some would teach that. We'll get to that when we get to, to some other things here. But some would, some would teach that. But that's, that, that really is hard to explain from this passage, the idea of subsequence of the Spirit, that you're saved and later received the Spirit. No, you're sealed. Everyone who believed, everyone who received, everyone who heard is sealed with the Holy Spirit. And because you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, God's mark is on you, God's mark is in you, then what can we know? We have a guarantee of an inheritance. We will receive salvation. So we have the guarantee until we acquire it. That's assurance to the praise of his glory. Again, who's done everything here? God has. Uh, He's not done it beside us or outside of us. We've participated in it, but it's God who has acted and initiated and and who is the guarantee by which we can have assurance. That's a great passage, again, um, to to keep in mind for yourself and for others who may struggle with the concept of assurance. 2 Timothy 2.10, Therefore, I endure all things for the sake of the elect, that they may also obtain salvation that is in Jesus Christ with eternal glory. So this is Paul's kind of personal mission statement. Paul, why do you let why do you keep going when you get shipwrecked? Paul, why do you keep going when you get beat? Paul, why do you keep going when your body's broken? Paul, why do you keep going when they keep arresting you? He says, I endure all things for the sake of the elect. God has a people and he's called me to preach to them that they also might obtain salvation. How is it that what is it that they need to obtain the salvation? They need the gospel brought to them. They need the witness of Jesus Christ brought to them. And so that's why he goes through and endures all of these things. Um, let's, let's look at this. Um, so observations from the, from, the, uh, from the statement here. All true believers endure to the end. Very clear statement. Very clear statement. But notice how that statement is worded true believers, right? And so, um, you know, we used to talk a lot, once saved, always saved. And, and I don't have a problem with that phraseology, but the problem is, is that, that sometimes we taught that in such a systematic way that it was, if you, ca- if you walk the aisle, then you're saved and you can never lose it, um, does anybody want to reference or find the reference for the Bible verse that talks about walking an aisle? You're going to be here all night because <laughs> it ain't there, right? Um, you know, or shook the pre. How many people do we know that we'll meet that that they made some kind of a a, a movement towards God? They walked an aisle. They prayed a prayer. They might have been baptized. They might be on the roll, but what they didn't do was genuinely experience salvation. And their life shows it. Their lack of um, spiritual fruit shows it. Their confidence in themselves, their, their appeasement with their sin. They may have a testimony that they've received faith by, by word only, but there is, there's no evidence, right? We, we see these people. James, that was much of the book of James, right? You say you have faith, but you have no works. Faith without works is dead. I'll show you my faith by my works. Again, Paul, he's not talking about works righteousness. What he's talking about is, I have a genuine assurance of my salvation. Why? Because I want to be like Jesus. I want my life to look like Jesus. I want to be a Christ follower. And so... Um, so, so we, ha- we have to be um, clear 
that as we talk about the gospel, we talk about what the gospel actually is, the, the concept and the idea of conversion, of regeneration, of a new life, being a new creature, a new, a new creation, because it is, um, it is it, there, there are many who make some kind of a movement towards Christ. They feel convicted of sin, but they do not genuinely, truly believe. And we'll look at some more passages and talk about this, develop this thought a little bit more. Um, but that's why we have to be careful. So, so the old way that, um, that this has always been talked about is not necessarily once saved, always saved, but perseverance. How do we know? I mean, here's the question. How do I know, how do I know that you're really saved? The way that I really know is to watch your life. To watch your testimony and as a pastor coming to your bedside in your final moments and hearing you talk about how much you love Jesus and you look forward to seeing him. To see a faith that endures difficulties. To see a faith that endures hardships. To see a faith that endures all the temptations to deny the Savior and to live for the self, to see that transformation. That's why in the Christian church, I mean, that's why it was a, it, it used to be a beautiful thing when Christian churches had graveyards and they maintained it for the membership. Because the idea of having a graveyard at the church was here's the rest of the church. And for Baptists, it was we knew that these people were believers because we watched their whole lives. But then it got political, and it got money, and anybody could come in, and so it stopped meaning that. Does that make sense? Um, for most, I'm not saying that there aren't some still that, that have kept a high standard and maintained that, but when, you, when it's like that, it's, it's really kind of a precious, a precious thing. And so, you know, the, how we know, how we know is, is by observing the life, observing that, that it is genuine that happened. And, and there's no time stamp on it, because I've seen, people, I've seen people in the church for 10 years that I never would have thought would fall away, and they fell away hard. And I, I pray and hope that, that it's just a, an experience and, and that they are genuine, but I have no confidence now, based on their life and their testimony, that it was genuine. Does that make sense? And so the issue there is not that they've lost something, it's that they never had it. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2. I, I still remember when I first read this verse. It, it, it gave me chills. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. There's a sense in which there are individuals who again, make some kind of move towards Christ. They have some kind of uh, guilt that they sense, but it is not genuine. Regeneration has not taken place, and we know it and we see it because the way that they fall away and they do not return. Now our hope again is that they may return, but until they return, we should, instead of having confidence in a fake testimony, share the gospel with them and pray that they would come to Jesus. And they may come back and very well have a testimony that I wandered away, I wandered into sin, and Jesus called me back, his spirit convicted me the whole time, I didn't show it, but it was working. Or it may be I experienced a bit of, of the church, and then I went wild, and then God called me and saved me. But either way, uh, our role when we see that is to call that individual back to salvation. Not to say, oh yeah, so you got baptized? Okay, you must be good no matter how your life looks now, what you say, what you do. Um, assurance. Assurance is something that is easier to have personally than to have corporately. Here's what I mean by that. I can have assurance of my life because I can... I can know my heart, 
and I can know my intentions. And I can seek to, to know and understand and see what Jesus is doing in me. So it's much easier for me to have assurance in my own life than the life of someone else. Does that make sense? Um, and, and so the idea is, is that we should all have assurance. There are general guides and general principles. But again, uh, the, the way that we have assurance that someone's salvation is genuine is because they're a follower of Jesus. They're, they're acting like a disciple of Jesus. When they don't, it's foolhardy and dangerous to their soul to pretend that they're a follower of Jesus, even though their life and the testimony they have now doesn't, doesn't show it. And I just say that because it's, it's easy to say it's hard to do, especially when it's someone you love, especially when it's a child or a grandchild, when it's a brother or sister someone who you love dearly and you really care and you really hope that they are saved, but you know you don't have that evidence, then, then we need, to, we need to, to pray for them, love on them, share the gospel with them, seek to, to, to restore them. Don't just let them go and say, well, you know, they were baptized. I, I, as a pastor, I hear this all the time. You know, they were baptized when they were a kid, so I'm sure they're okay. Are you sure? I, you know, this is how I talk to, and this is, this is what I as a pastor say to individuals that will say something like this. When I was younger, I came to church. I trusted Jesus. I was baptized. I started living for Jesus, and I've just kind of wandered away. But I know he'll save me no matter what I do. Have you met that person? I meet that person all the time. And here's, here's what I say as a pastor and as a theologian. Brother, you very well may have experienced salvation, but your current testimony by no means would give me any personal assurance that that was genuine. And it is dangerous for your soul to live the way you're living and to claim that you're one of Jesus's. You need to live a life of belief and repentance and seek to follow Jesus. And that's the word for all of us. That's how we know. That's where I'm saying that, that, that assurance is easier individually than it is corporately. Does that make sense? Um, so, it, so here's the passage. I, that you, unless you believed in vain... And there's other Bible verses that, that show us this as well, that there is individuals who have an experience that isn't genuine. Um, 1 John 2, 19, they went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they were not of us. And so here it's talking about those individuals who, again, would be part of the church, part of those who would have a testimony of faith, and yet they depart from Christ for some other way. They become uh, Judaizers and trust in the law again. They, they, be, they intermingle uh, Christianity with pagan religions. They become sexually immoral, immoral and try to justify it. Um, there, there's lots of occurrences in the Bible where we see individuals that, that fit this category, right? Right? I mean, this isn't talking about just they went to another church. I've seen that. I've heard that. <laughs> I've heard this passage preached because somebody, because somebody left and joined another church. Now, this is talking about people who have abandoned the faith, and they are no longer with us, and it's clear that they never truly were. Jesus himself talks about this. You remember the parable of the sower, or I like to call it the parable of the soils? It's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And there's four soils, one seed, right? The seed is spread. It's spread on four different soils. And Jesus talks about four hearts. The first heart is the, the stony path. The heart is so hard, the seed cannot penetrate. The gospel cannot penetrate. And that individual gains nothing from the gospel being preached to them. The second is the, the seed that falls on the rocky ground. And those represent... Um, those who have instant joy, but they have no root. Jesus says they endure for a while, but when trouble or persecution arises, they quickly fade away. It was not good soil. The seed did not take. Then he talks about the seed that's sown among the thorns. And again, the seed 
uh, shows uh, an immediate uh, response but quickly is choked out by the cares of the world, by the deceitfulness of riches, and you see no fruit. You see no evidence that it genuinely took. But then there's the good soil. And the seed falls in the good soil, and it comes up, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it produces not just a little bit of fruit, but much, much fruit. And you have no doubt that that seed took to good soil, right? Jesus uses this, he uses this parable as a way to teach us about those who would receive the gospel, about how the gospel is proclaimed. It's the same seed, it's the same message, and again, we we sow the seed everywhere, Don't be selective. Don't just go around looking for the good soil before you sow the seed. No, spread the seed. But as you see the response, know that these are the responses that we will see. Um, Continuing, it says, Those who God has accepted in Christ and sanctified by his Spirit will never fall away from the state of grace, but shall, and there's that word, persevere until the end. So again, the idea is perseverance. That's what we're looking for in ourselves, and and that's what we want to encourage in others. Why? Because we have the Spirit. We're sealed. We will endure. There may be uh, difficulties that come. There may be times of rebellion in our life, but if we truly are Christ's, the Spirit will draw us back. Um, Vance Havner. Anybody heard Vance Havner? He's an old Southern Baptist uh, preacher, evangelist, and uh, he, he is one of my preaching heroes. That man, that man could turn a phrase. He, uh, he was really good with words. And so here's one of his sayings that's, that's always lasted. The faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. The faith that fizzles before the finish was faulty from the first. The sign of perseverance is continuing in the faith. We keep on, not because of our own power, not because of our own ability, but because God is at work in us. His spirit indwells us. And we will struggle with sin. We may struggle with great sin. But if the spirit of God is in us and we are God's and we have experienced regeneration, God will continue to win us back. Amen? Um, believers, so here, here we're going to talk about this struggle. Believers may fall into sin through neglect and temptation, whereby they grieve the Spirit. So there's the Spirit, uh, the Spirit is not working in their life as the Spirit would want to. There is a tension, there is a struggle between the individual and their submission to the Spirit and the Spirit's work in them. Um, impair their graces and comforts. So that means that we can sin in such a way that that we can have doubt, that we can really struggle, that God himself even will punish us, not not unto eternal death, but he will cause things in our life to go upside down so that we run back to him. Um, They even can bring reproach on the cause of Christ, and even temporal judgments on themselves. You know, there's a number of people and situations that I know of that, I, I mean, I can't, I can't say this uh, in an inspired way, but I'm pretty sure God called them home early. They, 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 they started doing such and such a way that God, God, judge them in that way. And why can I say that? Well, I can say that because of 1 Corinthians 11 about taking the Lord's Supper. Remember that passage? Paul writes and says to the Corinthians that the way that you have mistreated uh, honoring Christ and taking the Lord's Supper, the way that you have mistreated this and, and that you have defiled this, some of you are sick and some are even asleep. What he's saying is God has executed judgment on some of you Because what you're doing is so horribly wrong. Now, were those individuals still saved? Yes, I wholeheartedly believe so. 
But, uh, but again, God will not be mocked. What we sow, we will reap. And even though God offers forgiveness, there are times where, where God executes punishment for us. He disciplines us. Um, and so this is why I believe we have warning passages in the New Testament. There are a number of passages. So, so our friends from other denominations, you know, uh, let's just, we'll pick on the free will Baptists, right? So free will Baptists, again, they believe in, uh, in a conditional election. And because they believe in a conditional election, it's very consistent that they, be, they, they have no eternal security. You can legitly lose your salvation, and, and they develop that because there are passages that warn us, that warn a believer, that are written in such a way because we have the ability to grieve the Spirit. We have the ability to live in such a way that we resist the Spirit, that genuine believers can live like the world. I believe that God has written a number of passages through inspired authors to warn us in such a way that those of us who have the Spirit don't want, uh, don't want what comes from that. Does that make sense? So theologically, it's very clear the nature of salvation, what God does. It is secure. It is God who keeps and God who holds and God who guarantees. But we also have these passages that I think are meant to, uh, to warn us a little bit. To, to, to keep us on the straight and narrow, to remind us of the importance of following Jesus and living according to our faith. Hebrews has a couple of these. I remember when Carville was teaching through Hebrews and, and, and went through them. Um, Hebrews 10, 26, for if we go on sinning deliberately after we receive the knowledge of truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. I think this is a, a, a hypothetical warning passage that the writer of Hebrews is writing, again, to warn believers not to live like the world. And, and the logic is, how can you believe that Jesus has died for you, that he's paid for your sins, but you're going to go on and you're going to live in sin, live in sin, live in sin, and think that it's fine? If you live like that, then why would there be a sacrifice for you? Why do you think that that sacrifice, I think that's the way that we're to take that passage. Again, that it's a, it's a hypothetical argument of an extent to make the person think and understand what goes on. Um, and again, we have such clear doctrinal passages that teach assurance. When we come to a passage like this, we can't just say, oh, there's assurance or there's not assurance. Uh, one of the biblical principles is we allow clear passages to interpret unclear passages. So clear doctrinal passages, especially when you see them written over and over again, that those are the one that we, we need to use those to uh, help interpret and understand things that may be more obscure. Does that make sense? All right. I know I'm talking a lot, but I'm going to finish. It, I'm almost done. Galatians uh, 5. For freedom, Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore. Do not submit again to the yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. You were severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you have fallen away from grace. I, I had somebody legit come up to me, and he's like, my mom had me circumcised as a boy. Do, do, can I be saved? <laughs> this, is, this is a whole different category of a warning passage. This is dealing with something that the first century church had to deal with, and that is they were coming out of Judaism into Christianity, and they had Judaizers also that taught legalism and taught to keep the law. And the struggle was, because your family and your heritage and everything that you knew was Judaism, the str and, and, and that, that, that was so strong in the church, and especially Gentiles then who weren't circumcised as infants, they were coming into the church and Judaizers were coming in, and, and they were telling them, you, you have to have Jesus plus circumcision. You want to talk about a hard way to grow a church. <laughs> And, and that's what they were teaching, is you have to have Jesus and circumcision. You have to have Jesus and keep the law. And so Paul's, Paul's pretty brutal in Galatians about this scenario 
the, and, and he says, you know, you're going to go back to the law. You're going to put that yoke back on you. You're going to live for that. If you want to live according to the law, if you want to live according to the old covenant, then you have no part in the new. That's the argument here. You have no part in Christ if you want to live according to the law. If you want to go back, then you have no part in Christ and what Christ has done. And so this is a little bit different uh, type of warning passage because it doesn't, I, I have no temptation to be a Jew. <laughs> um, you know, today I just, I have no temptation for that. But that's, there's other things that we could say that this would be um, equal to. But, but you see that? You see how this warning passage is particular about that? And um, the, final, the final article, so, so this is the last slide. Yet they shall be kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. So this is our hope, is that all who are genuinely saved, all who God has chose, all who come to genuine repentance and faith and experience the grace of salvation— they will be kept, not by their own effort, but by the power of God through faith unto salvation. Um, the nature of salvation gives us assurance, you know, just what it is, what God does, justification, uh, glorification, sanctification, uh, re regeneration. We've been made new. You can't go back if you've been made new. Um, salvation is the act of God, not the act of man. It's not our doing. It is his doing. Um, just the idea of justification. Justification is a declaration that all of your sins, not just your sins to that point, but all of your sins are justified because of Jesus Christ. God can't go back into the eternal courtroom, if you would, and say, oh, wait, I, I'm removing that ruling, and now your sins are on you again. You see, so when we understand other doctrines, it, 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 it logically makes sense, and the Bible is consistent. Um, and further, salvation is receiving eternal life. What does eternal mean? Forever, unending, eternal life. And so, what a, when, when we begin to understand this, and, and hopefully over the last few weeks as we've talked about theologically and looked at all these verses about the nature of salvation and the beauty of salvation and what God has done, my hope and my prayer is that it has just caused us to be incredibly thankful and grateful for what God has done. That's the reaction that we should have. If not, then your reaction is, man, I was really smart to choose Jesus. Everybody else is an idiot. Like, that's the two reactions you have when you start thinking about, when you start thinking about salvation, isn't it? It's either, it's either we we come and we trust in God and what he has done and we have nothing to boast about. And our, res our only response is to be thankful. Or we view it in such a way that, that we do boast. Um, and you better not be doing that. Uh, <laughs> so, so it does. It just leaves us with thankfulness. It leaves us with love. It leaves us, you know, this is why the Christian life should we have obedience in the Christian life? Yes. But obedience is motivated by love, not by duty. Obedience is, and some people struggle with this. John Piper gives this illustration. I'll give it real quick. Um, he says that, um, you know, imagine that if you, you come home from work and you buy your wife flowers and, um, and, and you, you come home and you give her a, a beautiful bouquet of flowers and she's just, oh, this is amazing. Thank you so much. These are so beautiful. Why did you do that? If you respond, I'm your husband, it's my duty, you're probably going to buy flowers and sleep on the couch. It's, it's amazing. The, no, the response is, I love you. I was thinking about you. I, I, I wanted to do something for you because, because I love you so much. That's the difference between a heart that is full of love for God and what God has done for us, that, that, that we have a desire and we want to serve God, we want to glorify Him, we want not to sin, versus the heart of legalism that says there's a God that I must appease by doing the right things. Do you see the difference? And when we think about salvation in these ways, we think about um, what God has done, how God keeps us, how we are His, and it leads us 
The, the, the more that we can do that, I'm convinced, the more that it fuels us to be obedient and to love and to be used by God. All right, let me pray and we'll be dismissed.